Good morning. Can I remind members of the COVID-related measures that are in place and that face coverings should be worn when moving around the Chamber and across the Holyrood campus? The first item of business is general questions. In order to get in as many people as possible, I would appreciate short and succinct questions and responses. And at question number one, I call Evelyn Tweed. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to ensure that people visiting rural Scotland, including the Loch Lomond and the Trossachs National Park, are aware of the Scottish Outdoor Access Code. Minister Mary McAllen. <clears throat> Thanks, Presiding Officer. Um, Nature Scott is the primary agency who is responsible for promoting the Access Code, um, and it works with key partners on awareness raising. For example, last year, Nature Scott's traditional and uh, social media activity saw over 15 million impressions, driving over half a million page views to the Access Code website. But of course, more needs to be done to raise awareness. So uh, Nature Scott are working with Visit Scotland and other members of our um, visitor management strategy group and will undertake a further campaign in 2022. Evelyn Tweed. I thank the Minister for that answer. There has been a notable increase in visitors to rural areas across Scotland, including rural Stirling. While most people enjoy the outdoors in a respectful manner, some do not. Can the Minister advise how we can encourage the public to treat rural Scotland with more respect? Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yeah, the Member is absolutely correct. The, the pandemic did see an increase in people spending time in our natural world. Um, enjoying its restorative benefits for our physical and mental health, which is perhaps a glimmer of light in an otherwise uh, very dark and difficult situation. However, Ms Tweed is also right that uh, this access must be taken with care. And I would reiterate that with rights come responsibilities and the statutory right of access is of responsible access. Um, so last year I mentioned our, our visitor management strategy. Through that work, we saw a much improved response to countryside challenges some of which the member has mentioned. Um, and out of that, the, the centrality and the importance of rangers and that face-to-face -face, uh, work that they do was very clear. And uh, I'm pleased to say that the Scottish Government is considering what we might do for the coming season, and I expect an announcement very shortly. Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer and Cabinet Secretary. I look forward to our meeting next week to discuss this issue. But the Access Code is nearly 20 years old now. And given the huge demands on the countryside, which became even more apparent during the pandemic, is it time for an update and relaunch? Minister. I know that this um, question has been considered, and I would say that from my understanding is that there isn't concrete evidence that uh, revision is required. We have been dealing with uh, different circumstances over the last couple of years, but I believe that education and communication are the key ways that we will continue to strike that really important balance between uh, an access right, a responsible access right, but an understanding that our countryside is a living and working one. And I think education and communication are the keys to that. But I look forward to discussing it with you further. Jackie Bailey. Um, Presiding officer, the Scottish Outdoor Access Code also covers access to inland waters. So in the context of Loch Lomond, can the minister advise whether she will consider robust restrictions on jet skis in the forthcoming review of bylaws, given the antisocial and often dangerous behaviour experienced as a result of irresponsible jet ski users last summer? Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the member for a really important question. The National Park have got really good track record, actually, of utilising bylaws to respond to some of their concerns, for example, with camping. I think something like 4 per cent around the loch is now within a bylaw. Of course, it's for local authorities and access forums to develop the plans for a bylaw. Um, and of course, Scottish ministers will consider them on their merits when they're presented to us. Beatrice Wishart. Thanks, Presiding Officer. As we move into lambing season, it's particularly important that livestock are not disturbed. How will the Scottish Government support livestock owners to ensure that the outdoor access code is adhered to on their land? Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the, of course, the Dogs Protection of Life Scotland Act 2021 came into force on the 5th November 2021, which strengthened the law around livestock worrying by increasing the maximum penalties for offences. Uh, Police Scotland, farming, crofting stakeholders are combining their efforts to address these crimes and behaviours. For example, the Scottish Partnership Against Rural Crime, which is chaired by Police Scotland, is launching the Livestock Attack and Distress campaign with the slogan, Your Dog, Your Responsibility. This 
is intended to educate dog owners about the new legislation through the lambing season in particular. And I think that the small minority who do not treat livestock with respect and care can and, and must be held responsible uh, and the consequences must reflect the severity of the issue. Question number two, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President. Officer, Sorry, excuse me, Mr McGregor. Oh, that's it. You're on now. Thank you. It's all right now. To ask the Scottish Government what support is in place to assist GPs in certifying power of attorney documents. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. Vacation of power of attorney documents uh, is a private matter between GPs and their patients. GPs may charge fees for, for providing the service at their discretion, uh, and they are not required to provide it uh, within the current contract. Fulton McGregor. Yeah, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. My office and the Local Citizens Advice Bureau in Coatbridge have been dealing with a significant number of cases recently where people, many who cannot perhaps afford legal fees, are struggling to get a GP to complete the certification documents, often citing the busyness of GP surgeries. We all know that GP surgeries have been extremely busy during the pandemic and continue to do a fantastic job as we work out of the pandemic. But I would therefore ask if there is any further support that can be provided to help GPs fulfil the very important task of certifying power of attorney documents for those who need them. Cabinet Secretary. Well, first and foremost, I of course explore if there is anything more that we can do in relation uh, to, to this. It should be said that there is guidance uh, that the BMA have provided uh, in relation to what fees uh, can be charged uh, in regards to this particular matter. What I will also do uh, is have a conversation with uh, Ash Reagan in relation to the eligibility uh, for legal aid in this regard, and I will come back to the member in more detail. Paul O'Kane. In the course of the pandemic, uh, people who have learning disabilities and organisations that support them raise concerns about the use of blanket do not resuscitate orders and indeed confusion about the role of power, attorney, of power of attorney in supporting and protecting people who have a learning disability. What further support can be given to GPs and other organisations to support in particular people who have a learning disability to ensure that their human rights are protected and we never again see a situation like we did regarding blanket DNR? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I say uh, to the member that we will look to explore what more we can do, particularly as we recover NHS? I know it is an issue that Paul O'Kane and members have raised to me before, uh, and I think all of us recognise that our constituents are still saying that they would like to see more face-to-face -face access with their GPs. Now, of course, we will look and work with GPs to restore that face-to-face -face access. And while we still have telephone, video consultation, I know how important that face-to-face -face access can be, particularly for those uh, that may have a, a, a learning disability. So what we will look to do uh, is, is continue to make sure that those with a learning difficulty uh, or indeed a learning disability, forgive me, uh, and their families uh, understand fully what their rights are. So I will take that away and see what more we can do with our third sector partners in terms of that communication. Question number three, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government what additional funding is being provided to restore and enhance rural health services. Cabinet Secretary. Our NHS recovery plan sets out key ambitions and actions to be developed and delivered now and over the next five years in order to address the backlog in care and meet the ongoing health care needs for people right across Scotland, of course, including those in rural areas. The Scottish Government also remains committed to the recommendations set out in Sir Lewis Ritchie's Shaping Our Future Together report, which aims to enhance primary care access uh, primary care across remote, rural and island communities. This year's PFG committed to delivering in this Parliament a National Centre for Remote and Rural Health and Social Care. Uh, scoping work is underway, with an expectation that this will be operational by spring 2023. Finlay Carson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. A uh, community group, the Old Loose Development Trust, my constituency, is stepping up to the mark in planning to build a new GP surgery which is uh, in excess, going to cost in excess of £400,000. The new surgery was identified by the Health Board in 2015, and although it has contributed nothing financially to this new development, it is my understanding that NHS Dumfries and Galloway has been told by the Scottish Government that it must carry out full options appraisals outlined in the Scottish Capital Investment Manual for guidance. This is, of course, for NHS projects. Yet two similar projects, Staff and Community Trust and Isle of Skye, uh, and uh, a new medical centre in Fort Augustus do not have to follow such guidelines. Can I ask the Health Secretary to investigate why this is the case and there is such a discrepancy in Dumfries and Galloway? Cabinet Secretary. I, I will. You will forgive me that I do not have uh, the absolute details uh, of the issue that he raises at hand, but I will take a look at it and I will come back to the member uh, in full detail. 
Okay. Question number four, Liam MacArthur. Thank you to ask the Scottish Government what work is being done by Sports Scotland and Creative Scotland to provide opportunities for children and young people. Minister Marie Todd. Sports Scotland works across clubs, communities and education to provide opportunities for children and young people to take part in sport. And um, We are working with Sports Scotland to increase the operational and staffing budget for active schools to drive and sustain the programme's inclusion work with a focus on poverty, additional support needs and care experience for young people. Via Creative Scotland, the Youth Music Initiative provides a year free, uh, year's free music making to every child before they leave primary school. Creative Scotland also supports the Nurturing Talent Fund, which gives small grants to young people to undertake cultural and creative projects. Lee MacArthur. Uh, thank you. Can I thank the Minister for her uh, response? In a discussion I had recently with a head teacher in Orkney, I was reminded how much children and young people have missed out over the last two years and how important the return to routine in our schools is in rebuilding confidence, reassurance and a sense of normality. But the head teacher also talked about the need over the coming months to create wow moments, things for pupils to really look forward to. I'm not sure uh, that she was angling for a visit from the local MSP. Uh, but would the Minister uh, agree to consult with Creative Scotland, Sports Scotland and other such bodies uh, about the role they might play in facilitating visits to schools across Scotland by those from the world of music, uh, theatre, film, sport, etc., in order to create such genuine wow moments? Minister. Um, certainly I will, and I couldn't agree more that our children and young people need those wow moments to recover from the harm that the pandemic has caused them, um, and be more than supportive of exploring it. Last year's Get Into Summer programme was a brilliant initiative, which aimed to create opportunities to socialise, to play, to reconnect, um, and it, it was in place right across all 32 local authorities, and sport and physical activity and opportunities, the cultural opportunities which improve wellbeing, were right at the heart of it. We intend to build Get Into Summer 21 um, this year to uh, deliver a Summer 22 offer for children and families in low-income households, and that will provide coordinated access to food, childcare and a rich experience activities. Brian Whittle. Thank you, President Officer. I know the Minister agrees with me that uh, uh, children having access to sport, music, art and drama can have, have such a significant impact throughout the rest of their lives. And she also recognises that COVID has such a, a negative impact on that. Um, does she agree with me that it will take significant uh, input from the government to redress that balance? And what, will the, what, will the government, what steps will the government put in place to make sure that our children do have access to all these uh, essential services? Briefly, Minister. Thank you. So I absolutely agree with Brian Whittle. Um, our work on adverse childhood experiences has shown us pre-pandemic just how important rich cultural and sporting experiences are and how protective that can be against adversity and how that protection um, can last a lifetime. So I have absolutely no doubt that we'll use that learning to um, invest going forward. It is actually everyone's responsibility. It is not simply government, but government certainly, and in my portfolio, we're doubling the investment over the course of this parliament in sport and physical activity, and I hope we'll see the benefit in the future. Question number five, Jamie Green. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether a mix of energy sources, including renewables, could facilitate a reduction in energy prices for consumers. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Scotland has, Scotland has had the good fortune to be blessed with huge and uh, variable, uh, vari varied renewable energy generation capabilities. Unfortunately, Scotland's ability to take full advantage of these resources has been curtailed by an unfair transmission charging regime which has directly disincentivised investment in generation in Scotland. Renewable energy presents better value for customers than nuclear energy and does not present the same safety and environmental concerns. The latest contract for difference auction delivered offshore wind at £39.65 per megawatt hour, substantially below the 92 uh, pounds per, uh, 50 pence award for Hinkley Point. Jamie Green. Uh, the only thing putting off investment in Scotland is this minister's moratorium on even the exploration of new nuclear energy that is putting companies off right now today from investing in Scotland. The reality is that renewables do not account for 100 percent of our energy. In fact, today 30 percent of it is coming from fossil fuels. A fusion power facility using less than one tonne of fuel could create as much energy as 10 billion tonnes of fossil fuels. So I ask quite simply, why won't the government drop this ideological opposition to nuclear fusion? Why won't it work 
with companies to support a sustainable energy source that will actually drive down consumers' bills once and for all? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so let me uh, address the point directly in relation to uh, fusion power. Uh, the reality is that fusion power is at a very early stage of development and at the very earliest it potentially uh, would be deployed in 2040, not something that is going to add to our energy mix in the short to medium term in a substantial way in any shape or form. So I think it is uh, misleading to try and give the impression that fusion energy in some way is part of the solution to the very significant challenges we have in the energy market today. But the reality is that nuclear energy is one of the most expensive forms of energy generation that you can pursue. And that is why, at the present moment, it is actually forcing consumer prices up because of the costs associated with nuclear power. And what we need to do in Scotland is to maximise our renewable potential, whether that be in wind and marine, but also in storage around battery and also hydrogen, and to make use of pump storage alongside also making use of CCUS if the UK Government can get its act together and support the Scottish cluster. Question number six, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the action it is taking to prepare for Ukrainian refugees arriving in Scotland. Minister Neil Gray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Tomorrow I will chair the first meeting of the Community Integration Partnership, which will bring together key partners across Scotland. And I will also meet tomorrow with the international non-governmental organisations of Scotland to discuss how they might contribute to the UK Government Community Sponsorship Route, given their experience from the Syrian refuge, uh, resettlement scheme. This will build on uh, the incredible partnership work already underway. And I want to thank uh, Scottish Government officials, who are meeting daily and sometimes hourly, and their partners in uh, local government public and private and third sectors uh, for their work over recent weeks. We continue to work closely with the Home Office, COSLA, local authorities and other partners to provide people with the safety and security they need to rebuild their lives. Uh, the UK Government proposals remain insufficient given the urgency and gravity of the situation and will continue to urge the UK Government to follow the examples of Ireland and countries across the EU and waive uh, visa requirements for all Ukrainians and develop a comprehensive resettlement programme to ensure that Ukrainian citizens can be provided with the safety and security they need to rebuild their lives. Willie Coffey. I thank the Minister for that answer. And further to the statement also made yesterday by the First Minister, can he confirm that work is going on to ensure that the Ukrainian people who will come here will have access to GP, dental services, childcare and even language support services to add to the warmth of the Scottish welcome they will surely get when they arrive in Scotland? Minister. Uh, yes, and I, and I thank uh, Willie Coffey for his interest and in, in raising those critical issues. We are engaging with a wide range of partners to ensure that wraparound support is in place for all displaced people arriving in Scotland, as the people who come here from Ukraine have a right to work, benefit and public funds will uh, be ensuring people are aware of and get access to such, uh, services such as those Mr Coffey mentions. We are rapidly uh, working to establish welcome hubs, uh, which will help to triage people and find out what support they need. Uh, multi agency teams are lining up support, which will cover a range of areas from healthcare to clothes and food, uh, welcome packs and information leaflets translated into Ukrainian uh, uh, about how to access support, including social security, will also be provided uh, and translators on hand to help. And Scotland, I, I reiterate, has a long history of welcoming and supporting people displaced uh, and uh, asylum seekers, and we stand ready to support the people from Ukraine, as we have other countries as well. Question number seven, Fiona Hislop. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what support it is providing to Ukrainian communities in Scotland. Minister Neil Gray. Scotland has a proud history of welcoming refugees and people seeking sanctuary from war and violence. The Scottish Government and Scotland's local authorities have made clear to the UK Government that we stand ready to offer refuge and sanctuary where necessary for those who may be displaced. And I look forward to uh, chairing the first Community Integration Partnership meeting tomorrow, which will consider how to ensure we are effectively supporting Ukrainian uh, communities in Scotland and will build on the work already underway. We will continue to engage with our Ukrainian communities as we work to ensure that all those arriving in Scotland as well as those already here receive the support they need. And I was pleased to meet uh, with the uh, Acting uh, Consul General uh, Yefien Markovsky when he was in Parliament uh, yesterday to discuss these matters directly. Fiona Hislop. Uh, the Minister will no doubt agree that it will be so important for Ukrainians seeking refuge from war to connect with the Ukrainian community here in Scotland and to be supported by local community support hubs. Can the Minister confirm what measures have been taken and at what pace to set up Ukrainian support hubs across communities in Scotland? 
Scotland. Perhaps, as the Ukrainian and Polish Consul Generals have suggested, with cities and towns twinning with other cities and towns in Ukraine, so communities can be together. And will the Minister join me in thanking all the Scottish families who have offered their homes for support and refuge? Minister. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Fiona Hislop raises very important issues around twinning, which uh, are being explored, and we very much welcome the generous, uh, generous office of, uh, of people to open their homes and their hearts to the people of Ukraine. Uh, I will absolutely join uh, Fiona Hislop in thanking families for offering their homes, their time, making donations, and for the messages of solidarity and support. As the First Minister said in uh, Parliament yesterday, our priority is to ensure we are ready to welcome displaced people from Ukraine to Scotland by the weekend, when the first visa, I hope, will start to be and the welcome hubs we are establishing will provide a warm welcome, safety and any immediate assistance. We will also be funding the Scottish Refugee Council to provide support for the Ukrainian Family Scheme and Humanitarian Sponsorship Pathway in Scotland, which includes planning for increased protection and integration support. Thank you. That concludes general questions.